And our first presenter um, is uniquely qualified to give this talk for two reasons. The first one is that he has, in fact, written a unit testing framework. And the second is that he has written a whole bunch of C in a context where unit testing is quite difficult. So the fact that he has volunteered to give this talk indicates to me that he has probably thought at least a small amount about this, which means he's qualified to talk about it for 25 minutes. Uh, ben O'Rice uh, lives in Seattle. He uh, works on FreeBSD stuff and is going to talk today about unit testing in C. Please make him welcome. Hi. So, yes, um, testing is a wonderful thing. Um, I could do the hands up who likes testing thing. I could also do the hands up who likes C thing. Who likes C? Oh, come on. Yes, that's it. C is the most fun you can have without safety equipment. Um, so, I'm just going to go a little bit into sort of why testing and, and just sort of, because things like unit testing and stuff like that sometimes have a bit of fuzzy definitions, so we're going to sort of start basic. Testing is awesome. Um, testing is awesome because it lets you know that your code's doing what it's meant to. Um, it's really hard to make forward progress on a code base unless you know that things aren't broken and that you haven't broken anything new. And this goes especially for legacy code bases. And let's face it, um, you pr if you're working in C, there's a high likelihood that you've got a code base that's got some years on it. Um, it's also hard to know that you've fixed bugs unless you test that you fix them. And testing comes in a whole bunch of different flavors. Um, testing can be done manually. Testing can be done in an automated way, which is even better because it's a lot less boring that way. Um, automated testing means you can feed your changes into some kind of test system. Um, it runs and it tells you, yay, you didn't break it, or no, you broke it, and preferably here's how you broke it and go fix it. Um, specifically, automated unit testing is awesome. Um, so, unit testing, in the way that I'm going to describe it, is aimed at testing what basic units of your code, hence the name. Um, unit is generally defined as the smallest thing that it's practical for you to test. Um, that can mean different things in different environments. Um, it can end up being a function or a method, but it's, it's not really sort of hard and fast rule. It could be a, uh, an expression within a functional method. Um, but the main rule of thumb is to keep the coverage area of that test as small as you can, which has some side benefits too in that it kind of nudges you towards um, having small bits of code that are easily testable. So what else defines a unit test? Um, the other main thing I keep in mind is that I only want to be testing my code. I don't want to be testing somebody else's code, which generally means that if you're calling out into library functions, you don't necessarily want to be testing those. You want to assume that they're going to behave in certain ways. Um, you can do this by using things like dependency injection, where you hand in a thing to your code that does things for you, and then during testing time, you can hand in a fake one that works the same way but is really just faked out. Um, or you can stub things out or mock them, mock them in various ways, uh, but we'll get to that later. The key thing to keep in mind is you're trying to re restrict the test coverage to the bit of code that's right in front of you. Uh, as soon as you're moving into larger bits of code, that's what things like integration tests are for. Um, and the last thing to say here is that it's fine to have more than one test for a unit if you're trying to test multiple paths through that unit. Um, so, for instance, if you have a happy path test, you can say, okay, all of the if statements succeed, everything's great. Um, but you could also have a, a second test that tests various failure paths and third and fourth, so on and so forth. Um, so, lastly, let's talk goals with testing. Um, some people aim for 100% test coverage, and that's fine. Um, but, firstly, coverage can mean different things in different contexts. Um, one notion of 100% coverage is that every statement in your program was run sometime during your test thing. But there's also a more stricter notion, which is branch coverage, which says that not only did every statement get executed, but every way that you could have come out of a given if statement gets tested. So, for example, if you've got multiple clauses that are awed together, you need to be able to test that each one of those fired correctly at some point. And that's kind of hard to do. Um, Getting to 100% coverage can be good, but I don't feel personally that it's necessary. What you need to work out is what kind of coverage feels right to you in a given circumstance. That said, if you can get coverage maps, which you can get out of a whole bunch of coverage tools, they're a really good way to find out bits where you're not testing your code properly or at all yet. Um, so generally, just be pragmatic. Do, do what feels right to you. So 
having nailed down what unit testing is, let's talk a bit more about how it's done. Generally, you use a framework. Uh, for example, this is a, uh, a Python example testing a fairly generic implementation of FizzBuzz, which is the world's best interview question. Um, you can see that we're testing one category of thing in each test. We're using Python's native unit test framework. And so when we run it, we get, you know, our tests passed. But hang on, this is about C, so let's talk about C. Um, C has, you know, doesn't have the best reputation these days in terms of writing code that's safe. Um, some of this is deserved. I mean, it's, it was designed back in the 60s, and it was designed to be as close to bare metal as you could get without actually being assembler. And because of that, it's got some fun gotchas, like, you know, the memory model being incredibly laissez-faire, and you very basic. Um, the other thing to think about is that while testing of software did exist back when C showed up, the methods that we used to do automated testing and unit testing today didn't. Um, which leads to things like, you know, C is statically compiled. You take the source code, it gets turned into some machine code, and at that point it's kind of hard to manipulate it unless you really know what you're doing. Um, more mo many modern languages, because they use things like virtual machines or much more sophisticated runtimes, um, can do things like swap methods out from underneath you, uh, redirect things, change things in a much more easy way, so Python and Ruby can easily change things. Even Objective-C has mechanisms for swapping method definitions out from classes at runtime. Um, and the reason that this uh, causes problems for C is that it limits your ability to test within a compilation unit unless you split your functions out into t lots and lots of tiny small files, which might not be the worst idea in the world, but it does cause, it can cause some headaches. The other thing that it does is restrict your ability to use mocks and stubs. So, as I said earlier, we only want to test the code that's right in front of us. To do that, you may need to replace or redirect some calls to other functions. And C makes doing that within a compilation unit really difficult. Um, doing it to calls in another compilation unit, but within the same linkage unit, is doable, but it needs careful planning as to source layout. There are some games that we can play with that, and I'll get to those in a bit. Lastly, coverage analysis. Um, getting coverage analysis out of C takes work again, because again, we can't sort of uh, dynamically instrument things. Uh, so generally, you have to recompile your C code with certain flags that emit coverage data that you can then analyze after the fact. Um, it's not impossible, it's just a bit more involved than, than some other alternatives. So let's actually show you how you can do this. Uh, again, we're going with contrived versions of FizzBuzz. Um, FizzBuzz, just for people who have not had an interview at a place that does FizzBuzz interviews, um, is an algorithm where you take a number and you return the string form of that number unless it's a multiple of three, in which case you return fizz, or if, it's, or if it's a multiple of five, in which case you return buzz, and if it's a multiple of 15, for both three and five, you return fizz buzz. Easy. You've now passed all of your tech interviews. Um, so how could we test this? Um, unit testing, as I said, generally involves a framework um, unless you're don't like frameworks, I don't know. Um, generally just to reduce boilerplate. Um, just how much boilerplate you can reduce in C frameworks is a bit of a, a good question. But there's two frameworks I've been going through here. First one's called Check. Um, this is what a, uh, a single test looks like in Check. You can see we've got uh, some macro boilerplate at the beginning and end that sort of mark up the test. Um, in, other in other environments, you could infer this stuff based on class inheritance or even just method naming, but that's a bit hard to do in C. Um, so you need to tell the framework where things are. So that, that's not too bad, but that's not all of the boilerplate you need. Um, here's some the rest of the tests that we're going to be running. I apologize for the uh, syntax highlighting in this. Uh, my uh, app got a bit confused with all the macros going on. Um, and so you can see that each test is just focusing on one particular thing. Um, so here we get to the next bit of boilerplate. Uh, check needs test cases to be grouped into test suites, and you have to do this on your own. So there's a function that does that for you. So you can see we're adding our test cases to our suite that we've created and then returning it. And then lastly, you need a runner. Um, so this is just a very simple main function runner, which I took from the examples that they've got there. 
Um, you can get a bit more creative. At a previous job, we were using this, um, this library in our development process, and we had a runner binary that would look into shared objects and find test suites that were in there and run those. You can do a bunch of ways. But assuming you've got all that done, you build it, you run it, and off you go. Pass checks, excellent. <coughs> so second framework that I was gonna bring up is uh, called uh, ATF and Cure. Uh, these started out as a Google Summer of Code projects in NetBSD. Um, originally was the ATF framework, which is the imaginatively named automated test framework. And the ATF tools package, which had the runner system, these eventually got split out um, into separate projects and ATF tools got renamed Cure, which is meant to be pronounced QA, but isn't. Um, and Cure can all now run ATF tests, uh, tap tests, and simple test programs that just return. Uh, success, failure, using exit codes. Um, so here's a simple test in ATF. Um, you'll notice that there's a bit more boilerplate around it. Um, the advantage of the boilerplate is that the head part lets you set things like descriptions, which you couldn't do in check. Um, you don't have to do that. There's an ATF TC without head, I think, um, macro that lets you not do that. Um, and that's, yes, I was right. Should look at my next slides. Um, so that's without the header part. Um, so filling in the rest of the tests again, we're doing the same kind of test as before. That font is very small, I apologize. Um, just the boilerplate is somewhat different. And that's the last bit of boilerplate that ATF needs because under ATF, um, you don't have to construct a suite. The test program itself is the suite. On the other hand, we do need to write a cure file which tells us where the test suites are and what the, uh, the test programs are. And then once you've done that, you can run all that and you get, uh, you can list your tests. Um, you can get descriptions if you added them. And then you can run your tests. Uh, you'll also notice that it stores results. You can use that to do uh, uh, JUnit and HTML reports and things like that. Um, so next part, You'll notice that in my FizzBuzz implementation, I am calling some standard library functions like stdup and malloc. So we need to work out how we deal with those because malloc is a wonderful place to discover problems in your code. Um, so this is where some of the real fun starts. C binaries on most systems are dynamically linked. Statically linked binaries, as opposed to dynamically linked binaries, everything that the binary needs is in the image itself. Everything's in there. Go binaries are a good example of this. Uh, Go links everything into one large blob and then you run that blob and it doesn't need to call out to anything else. Dynamic linking, which is how most C programs work, uh, means that only the application's code is in the binary, everything else is in a shared library somewhere else. When the binary is executed, a thing called the dynamic linker looks at the binary, works out what libraries it needs, maps them into memory, and then makes sure that all the calls that the application tries to make into those libraries point at the right routines. Uh, this is an important because it gives us a way around C's lack of dy dynamism, like this. So let's explain what's going on here. We've defined our own function called malloc. This will override the standard library's definition of the fun malloc function. In this malloc function, we are going and using a function called dlsim to find the real definition of malloc. And we're storing that in a pointer because then what we do is we test to see if our uh, failure code variable is zero or not, and if it's not, we return that failure, otherwise we call the real malloc. That last part is really important because if you override malloc without actually allocating memory and return it, everything will break. So this is an ugly hack, but it works. And it allows you to get around the fact that in a lot of cases you can't test, uh, you can't stub out standard library functions or provoke the right kind of errors that you need. Without this, if you wanted to test low memory conditions, you would actually have to run your process out of memory. So once we've done this, we can add a test to make sure that we handle malloc failure appropriately by saying, uh, by setting our malloc failure code and checking that it actually did the right thing. And we can run it and something goes wrong. Because, as I said, malloc is one of the fun functions to break and I wasn't checking that it actually returned something. So the right thing to do would have been to actually check for null. So, as I said, this is an ugly, ugly hack. 
what you should absolutely do if you're going to use this is that you make sure that anything remotely complicated in your stub functions is put into libraries and stuff so that it's easy to find, easy to see, and you're not just copying and pasting it everywhere. Um, so you can do something like this, where you've still got some boilerplate around it, but you can link against the library of test stubs. You can have different test stubs with different behavior for different functions if you need to, and you don't have to re-implement things all over the place in ways that could be, go horribly wrong. So coverage. When you're unit testing, it's always good to have an idea of what your test coverage is. And luckily for us, this is another area where C makes it tricky. Um, in virtual machine-based languages, like most things people use these days, except for Go and Rust, um, and even in languages where the, where the runtime isn't just, here's your stack, have fun, um, you've got hooks to emit coverage data. Um, in C, you have to build it in. How you do that varies, but it generally looks something a bit like this. Um, I've added the dash dash coverage flag, which tells it to build in coverage support, and I've also added dash O zero, because when you optimize, it often confuses the hell out of your coverage analysis. Um, after we compile, you'll see some of these GCNO files. They contain metadata about the, uh, metadata about the metadata that's about to be spat out. Uh, so we can then run our tests, and we get the GCDA files, which actually contains the coverage data. Um, it's not exactly human readable at this point, though, but there's a package out there called LCOV, which uh, will uh, post-process that data and sort of collect it together and give you this human readable output. Um, but it also contains another tool called GenHTML, which when fed that will actually give you something you can use. Uh, so as you can see, we, we got full, co full coverage here, so, so we're done. Um, this is not branch coverage though, but it's, it's the best thing you're gonna get that you're not gonna have to pay lots of money for. And the last area that I wanted to cover is testing main. Um, main is problematic because it's really hard to override. Um, you could play ugly macro games, like saying that when you're testing, it's not actually main. Um, another way you could do it is with things like ATF, where you can write tests in shell, uh, so you can actually just execute your function. So we can write a, a main function that has some, allows us to specify various things and the output, so we can specify a start point and a stride and a various things. And we can test this by wrapping some shell script around it. You can see that the structure of this looks similar to the C structure in ATF. Um, and you can sort of see how we'd expand this out into other tests. Uh, for example, testing the behavior of the start flag. Um, but actually what I find the best thing when, you, when you're trying to deal with testing issues in main is just keep main as small as possible. Uh, the more stuff you push out of main, the more stuff that you've got that's more easily testable. Um, you could even have a goal of trying to make it so that main's only job is to, you know, basically call get opt and pass command line options and then hand the rest off to something else to do. So, finishing up, C can be unit tested, mostly. Um, just like with the other languages, uh, you should use some kind of framework. Um, just like your application code, don't cut and paste stuff, especially when you're doing ugly hacks like looking up dynamically linked symbols. Um, use testing as a way to push yourself towards good design. Um, this especially comes if you're in a position where you're testing legacy code and you've got the opportunity to refactor. Um, if you can start refactoring towards something that's more testable, then that's great. And finally, be pragmatic and do what gets the jobs done. And with that, I'd like to thank Chris for running this excellent mini conf. And uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers of Seagull, where I, I presented this last year. Thank you, Benno. <laughs> uh, so we do have a few moments of questions. Uh, is Anwesha here at the moment, our next speaker? Yeah, if you can come and uh, plug your laptop in, that'll give us more time for questions so we All can right. change over the laptops while we uh, take questions. So first one is here, and then I'll come and get you. It seems like in a package you could provide an alternate version of glibc that is built especially for these stubs to fake out the different libc functions. You, you could, yeah. You, you could, and that would actually be a good thing to do. The, um, one of the issues that you might run into there is that there are occasionally platform issues. I mean, as Chris said, most of my stuff is more FreeBSD, than, and we don't use glibc, we have our own. So there are, there are quirks in there that, that might be important, but in general, I think that's a really good idea. And that's what you also find in things like um, uh, Vulgrand. Um, well, it uses LD preload tricks to override things like malloc. 
so that you're going through its own thing. And there are a whole bunch of debug malics out there that you can use as well. Oh, uh, we've got another question over here. Hi, so um, check versus ATF, pros, cons, should I bother to switch? Um, if I were starting my own thing, I would probably go with ATF, but there are multiple reasons to that, one of which is that there's a whole bunch of ATF infrastructure within the FreeBSD project, and a lot of the C code that I write has to do with that. Um, as I said in my previous job, we did use check, and it was perfectly fine. So um, if you're already using one, I would keep using it. Um, if you're not using one yet, then I would say try them both and give it a go. And I think we've got one over here. Hey, uh, so I generally when I write software, I can sort of come with sort of different, more, always trying to be a lot more portable. I suppose you're coming mm -hmm. from FreeBSD, but I always like to make sure that I test on like glibc, muscle, mm -hmm. and, uh, even other environments without a libc or et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, all these sort of LD preload hacks um, and sort of malloc interceptions as you described them all become ineffective. Um, so the pattern I've sort of ended up doing is I always you know, use some macros in my file and I always just put them in a single C file mm -hmm. um, and never reuse code uh, because otherwise you end up having to include things or port things that usually aren't well portable between different libc's and platforms or even compilers. So um, I, I suppose the question is like, if you are in an environment where you can't use LD preload hacks, mm -hmm. what do you do? Um, well, LD preload gets you one, is one way of, of getting around the, the dynamic linking stuff. Uh, the DL sim stuff that I did should work in most cases that are using a uh, real time linker. Um, I think I'm not sure if DL sim is a POSIX standard or not, but I think it is. Um, if you're in an embedded environment where you are statically linking everything, then really you're just going to have to come up with a way to statically link in test harnesses to do that kind of stuff. And again, I would say turn that into libraries that you can you can reuse rather than cut and paste. I forget how much exercise I get with when I run <laughs> these mini comps. I'm over here now. Hi. You mentioned compiling with uh, optimization off for coverage. Mm -hmm. What about cases where the optimizer does something that is completely legitimate, but a behavior you weren't assuming? How do you test those cases? Um, in production. <laughs> 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 more running, more running. Um, CMocker, how does that compare with the other two that you mentioned? I have not used it and therefore could not comment. Okay. It's, it's, it's CMocker is the one that Samba seems to have standardised on. Okay. Oh, I, I could turn that around and ask you how you found, have found it, but we can do that out in the hallway if you like. It, there'll be a talk in the hallway uh, with Andrew yeah. after this uh, talk. Finishes. Andrew Barlow would hold forth in the hallway. Uh, anyone else? I'm going to take that as a, as a no for more questions. Thank so, you again. Uh, everybody, please thank Ben O'Reilly for a wonderful talk. <laughs>